Okay, everyone, it is 12 o'clock on the dot. So thank you for joining us today. You are now in the Small Farm Conference uh, 2022 virtual webinar series. Today, our focus is on vegetables and vegetable production. This session is scheduled to run from 12 to 1.30. We have two different panel presentations happening today. Um, just some housekeeping announcements and questions will be made throughout the session in the chat box so make sure you navigate down to chat if you scroll your mouse over the pop-up screen it's the little bubble so click on that and open that up so you can see what is happening um, also if you would like to unmute when we have time for questions you can move over to the um, reactions tab and if you click on that you can raise your hand and so if you raise your hand we'll call on you and we'll allow you to unmute and ask your question directly to our speakers if not you can type it in the chat and myself or sarah hansen um, will help to relay that question uh, my name is laura ingwell and i'm an extension specialist in the entomology department here on the main campus at purdue and i'm excited to be your one of your moderators today um, our other moderator, Sarah, you want to introduce yourself quickly? Sure. I'm Sarah Hansen, and I'm an Ag and Natural Resource Educator in Johnson County. Thank you. Um, the session should have closed captioning, um, so hopefully that is turned on. Oh, thank you, Tamara. So for those of you who want closed captioning, um, Sarah is going to put in the chat how to find that. And with that, I am going to navigate past this first slide and say thank you so much for our sponsors. Um, we would not be able to hold this meeting each year without this, their generous support. Some of you have been with the Small Farm Conference since the beginning. And even though this is virtual, we do still have some costs associated with it, especially because we like to reimburse our farmers and our speakers for their time um, in participation. So thank you very much to those sponsors. Um, before we start the session, can you all please pull up your smartphones if you have one or navigate to the chat for the link and enter your demographic information. Um, so we use this to track our audience size and who we're reaching through our programming. So if you could please click on this and enter, um, answer three quick questions, I believe, um, on your demographics, we would really appreciate it. And with that, I am going to stop sharing and move on to introduce our first speaker. Okay, so Jesse, you should be able to pull that up and I will introduce. So our first presenter today is Jesse Frost. Um, he was with us last Friday, um, but in case you weren't able to catch that, um, Jesse is a certified organic market gardener, freelance journalist, and host of the No Till Market Garden podcast. He's also co-founder of the website notillgrowers.com, where he helps collect the best and latest no-till insights from growers in the U.S., Canada, the U.K., and Europe. He and his wife, Hannah Crabtree, practice no-till farming at their farm in central Kentucky, Rough Draft Farmstead. And today he will be presenting simple and profitable interplanting strategies. Um, so with that, take it away, Jesse. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you for everyone who is here today. And uh, let me get my screen share going here real quick. Um, get that. Are we good there, Laura? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, yes, welcome everyone. I am very excited to present on this subject because there's uh, you know, not a ton of information out there about this, but I think that um, interplanting can be a great way to boost profitability on your farm and use unused space, uh, and then also some ecological and biological benefits. Um, so we're gonna kind of talk about all that today. And um, uh, it is worth noting that I wrote the Living Soil Handbook 
And you can get this at the um, you can get this at notillgrowers.com. That's generally the best place to buy it because that uh, puts more money into the content that we create. So we create a bunch of different podcasts, and uh, we do articles, we do a lot of different stuff, um, videos as well to aggregate as much information about growing ecologically as we can, uh, ecologically and profitably. So that's kind of the goal. Um, but there's a whole chapter. Well, there's a there's a lot to this book, but one of the big sections in the book is about interplanting. Um, and it goes into much greater detail than I will be able to get to today, but I'm going to try and cover as much as I can um, and leave about 15 minutes for questions. So if you have uh, any questions, make sure to write them down or put them in the chat. Uh, that way we can try and get to all of them. Um, and also I host the No-Till Market Garden podcast, but this is a great resource uh, complement to what we're going to talk to talk about today and what I talked about on Friday. Uh, in fact, we've done whole episodes just on interplanting alone. I did one last summer, or maybe it was the summer of 2020. Yeah, it was the summer of 2020 with Daniel Mays just on interplanting. And I've done several others uh, in that on that subject. So um, this is my farm. This is my family. Uh, we do about one acre in central Kentucky. And uh, obviously not everything we do is interplanted, but we do a significant amount of interplanting as you will see. Um, and uh, it's about one acre now. Uh, this is a new farm. So it's just up to about one acre now. Uh, that's my wife, our two kids. Um, the let's, so what is interplanting? This is kind of just address the basic idea here. Um, Interplanting is effectively planting two or more of the same plant family in the same or different, sorry, planting two or more plant families in the same area. This would be, um, you know, like here's an example. This isn't the this isn't the example I always use, but this is uh, beets and you know and uh, onions or alliums and the amaranth family. This is, um, you know, this is two different families. This one, the beets are not known for their. Uh, mycorrhizal connection. So if you're trying to keep your mycorrhizal fungi alive and active, this is, you know, pairing green onions with something is nice because green onions do make mycorrhizal associations. So that will keep those fed while you're getting a good beet crop, you know, ready for the next crop. So, um, you know, that's just kind of an example, but planting two or more plant families in the same area, this can be, it doesn't necessarily have to be two families. Like I've done radishes below broccoli, um, you know, it's two brassicas, uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be different. Uh, the benefits generally come though from having different uh, families, but doesn't mean doesn't. There's no hard and fast rules there. You can you can make it make sense for what you need. But in a situation like broccoli, it makes sense because you have a very slow growing crop. Um, may as well pair it with something really fast, like maybe arugula or maybe radishes or turnips, even um, something to get a crop out of there while your other crop matures. And we'll talk more about that uh, here over the next few minutes. Um, sometimes called, you know, it's sometimes called intercropping, polyculture, companion planting. There's a lot of different terms for it. Um, you know, uh, there's probably some nuance to these and I, you know, and, but it seems like a lot of people use them more interchangeably in popular, you know, usage. So, um, there is one here that kind of stands out like companion planting, uh, companion planting is often associated with using one crop to bent to directly benefit another crop. So that would be like, um, you know, there are studies that show planting green garlic with strawberries reduces certain disease pressure. Um, there's a lot of that sort of thing. So that would be like an example of, uh, of a companion plant. Now, generally speaking, these are all kind of companion plants, right? They all are going to interact with each other's subsoil and above ground. Um, and so they all, I, I don't really use that term because there's it's too nuanced to say that one is necessarily a good companion of another. Um, and I haven't really found a lot of bad companions. Like there, there's some that people say to avoid like fennel and that's maybe one I don't pair with a lot, but I've had decent luck pairing fennel with lettuce and then fennel with even celery. Um, so it's, you know, there's, there's, there's rules there to an extent, but for the most part, um, I have yet to run into a pairing that just absolutely was not the best pairing, except for planting long season stuff with long season stuff, I generally recommend people stay away from that. And I generally recommend, um, you know, utilizing the space as it makes sense. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that, but I would, you know, like planting a very fast crop while a slower crop matures. Um, polyculture too, there's, there's a lot about planting uh, perennials and 
uh, annuals around your perennials. And that's fine too. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Um, you know, if there's a time when those perennials are not productive or they're not overshading uh, an area, you may as well get some some annuals out of that. And that will also help you. Let's say you have a, uh, you know, an apple orchard um, and you can grow some stuff. You are in a mild or enough climate that you could grow some stuff over the winter around the base of the plants when there's not a lot of leaves on them, or even in the summer when uh, between the rows, when there are a lot of leaves on them for a little bit of that extra uh, shading, then that's, you know, that's an example of a really good effective way to use polyculture, um, sort of, uh, uh, you know, in the aisles. And, um, you know, but, but, you know, the big question is like, why you've this, it, it, it can be really complicated. So the big question is why bother with that complication? Um, and there's a lot of actually good reasons for it. Uh, one is biodiversity, right? You're bringing in multiple plant species. So that's going to bring in uh, plants are drawing in carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight, and turning that into glucose. And then they're mixing that glucose. That's photosynthesis, right? They're mixing that glucose into these special specialized cocktails that draw in certain microbial life. They uh, feed the soil in certain ways. They can adjust the pH of the soil. Um, so that, that, that biodiversity is actually really important for just improving the overall biodiversity of your soil. Um, profitability, like I said, if you have a slow growing crop, and you can get another faster growing crop underneath of it or in, in front of it or, you know, beside it, however it works, um, then, you know, that boosted the amount of money that you made on that square footage. Uh, maybe you can get a quick round of radishes before your ginger comes up and then your ginger is going to be there for 120 days in your tunnel or whatever, but you've got that round of radishes to make you a few hundred dollars before your ginger comes up. So that's an example of profitability. You're making money where you wouldn't normally be making money. Um, using unused space, fill gaps. That's kind of what I was just talking about. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So I won't go too much into that at this moment, but, um, yeah, filling gaps. Anytime you have space that's unused, something should be growing. That's good for your soil, um, but something should be growing because that's good for your for your for your bottom line for your income. Um, so, also diffusing sunlight. I spoke about this a little bit on Friday. This, uh, you know, one of the things that we often forget is that plants need diffuse sunlight because every part of the plant that's green. Uh, this lettuce isn't the best example, but. Every part of the lettuce that is green can photosynthesize, but if the sun is just pounding directly on top of this and it's not getting bounced off of other things, uh, it's just going to kind of singe those top leaves or dry them out, dehydrate them effectively, and it's not going to get down to the bottom leaves where it could be if you could get sunlight down there photosynthesizing so that improves its photosynthetic rate um, and makes it uh, a faster crop, a better crop, a more, a more well-rounded uh, crop. And so having things around it, like in this case, green onions, um, is a way of like diffusing a little light that could be, you know, kind of bounce under those small, those lower leaves. Um, and that's, this isn't the best example, but having a taller plant, like a, we'll see this later, uh, like a tomato or a pepper or something above here, bouncing that light down to those lower leaves, um, provide shade. That's also a good thing. If you have really tall plants, you can shade some of the lower ones. I've one of, one of the things I've done in the past is mixed, um, sunflowers and lettuce. These are both daisy family, but they are, um, but the sunflowers while they're maturing, they've got this nice foliage um, and they, you know, kind of provide a little extra shade and a little more diffuse light in the middle of the summer for our summer lettuce, which we grow a lot of. Um, or a windbreak. We've done it beside corn too. Uh, we've done lots of crops beside corn and that helps because it's, you know, it keeps them from getting too dried out in the summertime and, and, um, just uh, helps with water retention and those sorts of things. Um, attract pollinators. We're also going to talk about, you know, in, uh, adding a few flowers here or there um, and deter disease or pests. Uh, so, you know, I have an example maybe coming up. I forget if it's right away. No, but of using nasturtiums with cucumbers. Um, nasturtiums, they seem to for us, and it, it, it hasn't been every year it's worked as well as it does some years, but the, um, they will help deter cucumber beetles because the smell is so intense that they can't smell the cucumbers because nasturtiums are very fragrant. Uh, same with marigolds and that sort of stuff. Now it's not a perfect, uh, you know, remedy, but it, but anything you can do to help in those situations is always a benefit. Um, so let's talk about some simple interplanting strategies. Um, the first thing I say is if you're new to this, start with one of the most forgiving versions, which is peppers and tomatoes. Peppers and tomatoes will let you get away with a lot 
because they're not so worried about these top few inches of the soil. They're trying to get deep into the soil. Um, so they're, they're not worried about a little bit of competition, especially if you're putting transplants instead of, you know, trying to start it from seed in your garden or something. And you should never do that with tomato plants is too, they, they take too long to germinate and grow. But, um, if you put a transplant in there, you know, it's already established enough in its block that it's going to take off fine. So you can plant other stuff beside it. Um, so let's talk about some examples of that. This is also an example of the diffuse light. These are, um, uh, what were these banana peppers? And you have, you can see the lettuce below the, below the banana peppers. Uh, you can see the green onions. You know, I always have green onions on hand just to put into space wherever I can find it because they're just really, they're such a great uh, non-competitor. But yeah, you have all these nice, this nice little canopy diffusing light down to these, these uh, lettuce plants. Um, and you can see a few that I let go underneath these tomatoes, but that's not a big deal. We'll just go and cut those out. And I'm, I'm always all about a little bit of flowers in there. Um, so we, yeah, that, that's kind of a basic example. Here's another one. That's actually before they bolted, uh, that same plot. These are just cherry tomatoes. And then you got your lettuce planted below. So I'm getting a little extra benefit from this crop while this crop matures, right? Um, cause this is hundreds of dollars worth of lettuce. If you get two cuttings off of this and then, you know, you have, you know, thousands of dollars worth of cherry tomatoes following right behind that. Um, this is one in the field. So this would be like, um, uh, uh, beets planted. I showed that, I think I showed this slide on Friday too. Beets planted below, um, tomato, cherry tomatoes. So the cherry tomatoes are maturing, but I'm going to get this beet crop off probably seven, two weeks before these started to mature fully. Um, and again, kind of taller crops, diffusing some of that light down onto those lower leaves. That's what you want. Like that's a bit, you're getting multiple benefits there. And plus you're getting two different crop families in the same bed. Um, and then you can kind of go bonkers with it if you want to. I don't necessarily recommend that, but this is like, this is kind of how forgiving, I guess, is an example of how forgiving tomatoes are and how, um, you know, how you could attract pollinators. So this is sweet alyssum. I like to plant that below our tomato plants and let that mature. And it draws in brachinoid wasps and the brachinoid wasps are uh, the parasitic wasps for the tobacco hornworm, tomato hornworm. Um, and then also you can see some basil under here. You don't have to go like that. Like this is way over the top, but this is, you know, sometimes I enjoy doing these things. Um, but just an example of like what you could do in theory and get away with, with something like tomatoes, uh, as long as your moisture is there. Now, one thing about this is you will get a little bit of weed seed in, in the spring with your, with your, um, from your sweet alyssum. And it's also possible it could harbor a uh, harlequin beetle. So you may, after they're done flowering, want to cut them out. Um, but something like that, you know, and then basil usually does really well below tomatoes. If it, I know it's, it's kind of cliche, but if it grows together, it goes together. Um, generally does work. Uh, I've not had any major issues with that. Um, so yeah, and that is, a, that's also like one of those, you know, every rule is made to be broken thing. Like the, um, uh, long season with long season. This is an example of it working. I've also tried celeriac with peppers and it worked, but it wasn't, it wasn't like my best, uh, it wasn't my most successful, uh, pairing. I wouldn't do that one again, for instance, but this one I'm fine with. Um, so you're using space while crops establish themselves. You know, you, that's, this could be hundreds of thousands, if not thousands of dollars, depending on, you know, how much space you're talking about, uh, worth of crops, like even just having some green onions here, if each one of these bunches I sell for 250 a piece, there's, uh, probably 250, 250 of them bunches there, 200 bunches there in between these pepper plants. So, uh, you know, just depending on how long this bed is. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's a, that's an immediate, uh, you know, income that I get while these peppers are maturing. Um, so here's another example, uh, split beds. This is, this is actually on our old farm, but we do this a lot. This is like the simplest, most straightforward way of approaching interplanting is actually just splitting the bed in half. You're putting one crop on one side and another crop on the other side. So you're getting a little bit of that benefit of having two different, because these crop, these roots are certainly mingling, right? Um, and you're not, it's not overly complicated. Like the ones that I showed you earlier, I don't do this, uh, this as much anymore. Like it's just too complicated. Um, I do a lot more of this then like even now I, I, it's good because maybe I decided to use some lettuce in another spot, but I have enough for half a bed. I can throw half a bed here, half a bed of spinach or half a bed of green onions and half a bed of spinach or whatever it is. And that just makes it, 
it's a little bit easier for me to manage. And then you can harvest from both sides and plant from both, like from the one aisle, you can harvest from both sides. So it's like harvesting a whole bed without having to reach over it. Um, you know, that's, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be like this, but this is a one way you could utilize it. Um, filling gaps. This is probably like the easy, one of the easiest ways to get into it. All of us have had who grow carrots have had that moment where we've, you know, sown a bed of carrots. Um, and it's been a mediocre germination, either from the seed or from lack of moisture, but it's like not quite mediocre enough to terminate the bed, right? It's like a wasted bed because it's not going to gain, it's not going to garner the amount of money we need from it, but we don't want to get rid of it because we want carrots or we need carrots or we, you know, it's enough that we can use them, but whatever. It's like a waste of space to an extent. Um, I always have lettuce on hand that I can shove into carrot spaces or any gaps than direct seeded crops. I just have head lettuce, or in this case, I have salanova. So this is more of a cut lettuce, but generally I have a head lettuce, excuse me, a head lettuce on, on, in my greenhouse, just a full tray that I can just, if I see gaps, I'll go out and shove head lettuce into it. Um, and there's no, you know, those tend to work really well together as long as the carrots are already established. Um, you know, and here's another example. Like I, like I said, I don't do this as much anymore, but sometimes like if you run out of space, you're like, oh, I didn't account for that green onion bed. Um, I'll shove my green onions in between my lettuces like this and it tends to work pretty well. Uh, you know, we get a good crop out of this as long as you've got the fertility management up there. Um, and you can even see head lettuce underneath beans right here. Um, and I think that was a Cherokee, like a romaine, red romaine. Um, and yeah, that, I mean, that's a super simple, you know, super simple approach. And it's a good way of being like, oh, I have this extra, this extra crop, or I need an extra crop really fast. I don't have a place to put it. I've done this many, many times and it, it works fine. It's just a lot of extra work because it's literally planting a bed twice. Um, easy interplanting crops. Like these are a few of the just good starters. Uh, green onions, like I said, I grow a lot of green onions because we can sell them all summer without problem. Um, and they hold really well in the field and they hold really well in the greenhouse. So we just don't, they're just, they're an easy crop for this. They're just a no brainer for us. Um, head lettuce, we, you know, do, uh, we can put that anywhere and then you cut it out and it's gone. So if something else is coming into that bed, your head lettuce is just, you, you take the whole thing with you and same with things like radishes and beets and turnips and, um, uh, arugula is not quite the same. You still have to terminate that from the bed after you're done with it. Um, but yeah, that's an option too. And things like cilantro, dill, some of those herbs, those can be used in there too. Um, it's just, again, if you're, if it's a crop that you're not tip removing it from the soil, like you are green onions, all these, these first five, uh, you do have to know how you're going to terminate it. Um, oops, uh, intermediate interplanting, like this is the intermediate skill. Uh, any of these 50 to 70 day crops are, can be a little bit more complicated. Topsoy is not bad because it's more like that 40 to 50 day, just depending on the variety. Uh, but, you know, even bok choy too. But um, carrots are complicated. I don't like to interplant them into a bed that's going to have any competition because they have what's called a, um, a poor... Uh, 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 what is the term that I'm forgetting that I wrote a whole thing about it in my book, but the, their, um, their competition, they're not good competitors. So they, um, they will often not put in, they'll put, if they have a lot of competition, foliar competition, like they have a lot of leaves around them, they'll actually put more energy into their leaves than into the root. And that becomes a problem because you end up with really beautiful greens on your carrots and really small roots. So you don't want to, you don't want to push their competition um, too hard. You want to, you want to allow it, um, you know, to, uh, you want to, if you're going to interplant with carrots, you either want them to be out by the time you're putting something else in or really mature by the time you're putting something else in, or you want that something else to be out before the carrots are really starting to establish themselves. Cause you don't want the, the foliage obviously is not the point of carrots. Um, and, uh, okay. So I, I definitely need to touch on crop rotation because this is always the biggest question we get. I touched on this, I think a little bit on Friday, but it's, it's good with this explainer because you can see. So um, our crop rotation is actually much more simple than you'd think. This farm, we just moved here from our old place in December of 2020. So this was June of 2021. So this is not the full garden yet. You can't totally see it yet, but um, this is where we were in June of 2020. So uh, these this area right here is our intensive plots. And for the most part, except for this garlic that we had to put there last year, that's not there now. And same with these tomatoes. We don't grow tomatoes and, and garlic in this in the intensive plots. This is just for lettuces, 
uh, radishes, green onions, beets, um, summer squash, uh, some of the faster crops. And the reason is, is because that just makes um, uh, crop rotation really simple. And it's also the way that we manage these beds is in a deep compost mulch. So more expensive approach to bed management, um, but it, it, they have less weeds and we can manage these uh, with, you know, like just the compost. And then the, that, that sort of that crop list I just gave you, our crop rotation is essentially, we just don't plant the same thing in the same space for a year. So you can see like lettuce here, we probably did lettuce and then we did beets and then we did green onions and then maybe we did a round of summer squash and then we did uh, maybe some something else radishes or something for the fall um, and then maybe we did like oh uh, yeah I think we had the longer season brassicas for the fall um, and so in the spring we'll start some other rotation maybe we'll I think we're doing carrots here and then so it just goes like that it's just the next crop in that sort of line and I don't have that line completely perfect because it, it changes a little bit based on how much we need of something. Um, but generally we just don't repeat the same thing within a, within a 12 month period, but we're doing three to five crops in a year, you know? So, um, our certifier has been fine with that. And as long as they remain fine with that, then that's what we'll roll with. So that's how we do. So if I did lettuce here beside these, uh, tomatoes, I'm not going to plant lettuce on this side. I may still plant it on the other side, like the split bed thing. I may just split that bed in half and plant it on the other side and plant beets on this side. Unless I have a disease issue, I don't have any reason not to. Um, so with the other side, with these slower rotation plots, so this is our intensive, this is our extensive. These are slow rotation crops like um, garlic is in this plot now. This one will be, uh, this one's actually going to be some spring carrots um, just because it can be, but then uh, it's going to go into late brassicas and then spring it'll be, next year it'll be potatoes uh, or sweet potatoes. So sweet potatoes, corn, potatoes, uh, late tomatoes, late brassicas, garlic, onions, slower crops. Um, those are, that's what this rotation is. So that just goes in a rotation like that. Um, and that's it. I mean, it's, we, we try not to overcomplicate it. It seems like it would be complicated, but if you're just not repeating crops, then in those areas, we just don't, you know, uh, then we don't worry about it. And, um, let's talk about some of the more complicated ones while we have a few more minutes. Um, this isn't one I necessarily recommend starting with definitely. Uh, but it is fun to think about this because there may be opportunities for you to utilize it a little bit on your farm. So this is called relay cropping. I let, I planted these squash into some, um, uh, radishes this season. We do it every year, really. I have radishes in the bed that the squash are going into soon. Um, so we plant, uh, yeah, we plant zucchini into our radishes and then we pull the radishes, obviously. Zucchini kind of takes over the bed. And before it does, I sow green onions. And um, after the green, after the zucchini come out, the green onions kind of take over the bed and then I'll plant in some Napa cabbage or something. Um, and then the, uh, you know, the Napa cabbage will slowly grow. I'll pull all these green onions and then the Napa cabbage has the bed. So that's, I'm basically utilizing the space while these are growing, I'm getting these established. Now, like I said, that's really complicated. And, and there's been a year where I tried to sow this and the germination was so spotty, it wasn't worth keeping. But the benefit is if you've bought bulk green onions, like we do, um, you know, it's not that big of a seed waste. And we added some biodiversity to this bed and it wasn't the end of the world and the squash did wonderfully. So it wasn't a, um, you know, it wasn't a total loss, but it was, you know, we weren't able to keep that bed. It wasn't worth our time. Um, but we went ahead and sowed it in there. So we got that biodiversity feeding the, the mycorrhizal fungi and the other fun and the other soil organisms. Um, and then, yeah, we moved to this, uh, to this here. And I used to call this like the everbed system, try and keep a bed in production at all times, like one crop always, but that's, that is really complicated and that's really tough to do. Um, but it's fun. And it's, you know, if you see an opportunity, it's worth experimenting, even on a small, just try 10 feet, see how it goes, just see if it works. Um, it's fun to do that sort of stuff. Uh, here's an example of those, those nasturtiums planted around our cucumbers. You can't really see them. This is the old, is an old photograph, but, um, the, uh, yeah, nasturtiums doesn't have to even necessarily be in the same bed, just planted. I think this was this one. Some of these were in the bed, like it split, like every five plants, I think I put a nasturtium plant and then I went back to cucumbers. Um, and that works pretty well, but it gets kind of messy. So I, I kind of prefer to have them in the bed next door. Um, then, uh, some 
people often ask about like, how do we fertilize in those situations? Uh, this is one method I've found that works pretty well, which is like, this is like fish meal and alfalfa meal and humic acid and kelp, I think in this mix probably. Um, but I actually just throw it in the earthway cedar with a, with the, the, uh, P plate. And as long as it's dry enough and this, and the material is fine enough, then I basically just sow it like it's a seed, um, down the bed. Uh, and that works okay. Or you just fertilize really well to begin with. Um, you can also do drip irrigation, like fertigation. Uh, that's another, you know, effective a way of doing it. Um, and yeah, I think that's it for those. I want to touch, let's see, make sure I have enough time. I'm going to just talk about this real fast. This is um, perennial cover cropping is something that comes up a lot. People often have questions about like, uh, there's this idea of like putting a crop into a living mulch into like just going ahead and, and I've tried this in many different ways. I have like cardboard down here and then I put a nice thick thing of mulch and I kept all this mode. Um, I've just never had any good success doing anything in this system. Um, I've tried it a few times and it just, it's always like the, the weeds take over the crop is hungry and thirsty and it just never, nothing ever does well in that scenario. Um, but I think this is a better for us. We do a lot of, if you want those, some of those same benefits of having like just a great photosynthesizing ground cover, um, maybe something more like living pathways work better. And I, and I talked about those on Friday. So if you missed that talk, you can, you can go back and watch that. Um, but yeah, essentially just having a living pathway is the same thing in effect as this, oops, is this, um, but you have, you're not worried about these weeds here. You have this nice bed established with all this living material that you can keep mowed and managed on the sides out of the way. So it's not going to be obstructing your, whatever crop you're trying to go in this case, in this case, squash. Um, so it is about 1230. Uh, and I know it's about 15 minutes left and I figured if you all want, then we can take a few questions. And um, if we run out of interplanting questions, I can take soil health questions or general market garden questions as well. Great, thank you so much, Jesse. Um, so at this point, if you would like to ask your question directly to Jesse, just navigate down to that reactions and click raise your hand, and then we'll see your little virtual hand up and we'll call on you or you can um, type your questions in the chat and we can read them out for you. So while we're waiting for some people to generate questions, Jesse, um, Ashley Adair asked, do you ever have problems with onion thrips? We don't, we haven't. Uh, that doesn't mean it won't happen at some point. We've not had thrip issues here. Um, no, no. Uh, yeah, unfortunately I don't have any experience with it. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's a, system management thing or if i've just gotten lucky um but yeah that yeah that hasn't been an issue for us um yeah. great the next one is what's the difference between relay cropping and succession planting right relay cropping would be uh that you're planting it you're planting them uh at the same time like they're growing together and succession planting would be you're planting one crop after the same after the first one so um you know, an example of, uh, like I gave you the example of the relay crop, but a succession crop would just be like, I pull my lettuce and then I plant my beets or something like that's the succeeding crop. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's kind of the difference. Relay cropping is often practiced more in larger scale agriculture, like that term. Uh, you'll see it with like, um, you know, corn producers, and I forget exactly how they do it, but you'll see it like maybe they plant their wheat, um, they have their wheat about ready to come out and they'll go ahead and sow their corn and then they'll come over or they'll sow their corn as they're harvesting their wheat. Um, so they're kind of trying to get that second crop going while the first crop is not entirely out of the bed yet or out of the field in that case. Great. Ty asks, are there any big interplanting no-nos? Um, yeah, give everything enough space. I think it is a big one is not overcrowd stuff. I, and I think the biggest no, no is trying to use carrots too much. Like that's one of the big ones we've learned is just, um, carrots are not going to compete very well with other crops. Um, overshading is really common thing. Uh, when you just, your timing's off a little bit. Um, and, 
you know, using, getting a little bit of experience before you start throwing too much stuff in the same bed at the same time is good. Just kind of, it's okay to not interplant, to get some practice, to learn how crops grow and learn the speed at which they grow um, and work with that. And another thing I didn't mention, this doesn't necessarily pertain to that, but I didn't mention, you know, this is interplanting is like an ancient thing, right? Uh, you know, we know of three sisters is very common and very uh, famous form of interplanting, but it's also very complicated. They, they timed their plantings um, depending on if they were doing corn or beans or corn and beans and squash and uh, oftentimes sunflowers and those sorts of things. They timed those very well to make sure that every crop succeeded really well. Um, so it's not just about throwing all three seeds in the ground at the same time and just ho hoping to get something good. Like you do want to maximize your yield. So you want to know that you understand the growth habits of each of those plants um, and feel confident in that. Maybe you start out with two different crops and then maybe you can try a third sometimes. I don't go that wild. I generally stick to two crops and occasionally I'll throw a third. Like maybe I have a bed of tomatoes and on one side I have lettuce and then the other side I have uh, onions or something. Um, I generally don't go too over the top on that. Yeah. Great. The next one in here is from Urban Soil Health. Do you do any late season intercropping for cover crop establishment? For example, oats and peas under established brassicas. Yeah, I'm all about that. Like I think crimson clover is one that establishes really well. Um, or I know it is. It's it's a great, you know, that one uh, underneath brassicas, like that's a really popular one. And we've had great success with that. The um, Any of those, if you can get it, it's, it's really about establishing cover crops underneath of your... Um, your, you know, brassicas is timing it so that they're not going to overtake them. Um, you know, you don't want to get your peas in too early so that your broccoli is all of a sudden not heading up very well because it's covered in peas. Um, but also making sure that you get good seed to soil contact. Uh, I like things like crimson clover because it stays pretty small, even, you know, well into the fall. So, um, or even rye, those things, like they don't get too, they don't go too wild. Uh, but getting the good seed to soil contact. So even using a seeder like in between the plants is, is the ideal. Um, broadcasting, it can work, uh, especially for something like clovers. They tend to be more, uh, they tend to take better in that scenario. Um, but I generally prefer just getting good seed to soil contact and just getting them you know, s directly sown in there. Um, but no, cover crops is a great question. I think that you know, intercropping with cover crops, absolutely. Kevin Allison asks, um, you mentioned not doing it too thickly. Is airflow ever a concern? Yeah, I mean, that's that's one concern, nutrients, water management. Um, I didn't talk about, uh, yeah, I mean, it really, it's in sunlight. I mean, all of those things will, will, will have a play a role. Um, I didn't mention irrigation. You generally do want to match your irrigation to your crops. Like you don't want like sometimes growing lettuce in the summer underneath tomatoes is not really a possibility for us because lettuce has to be overhead watered to cool it down. Um, so I wouldn't do, I would do something more like maybe beets or something under tomatoes in the middle of the summer. If I'm going to do that, um, usually those crops are out, but if it's getting hot, like it sometimes does early in June, then that can be an issue because you can't cool those crops off as easily. Uh, so you know, if you can match your irrigation to the crops you're using, and that's another thing, if you're planting them really densely and you have a bunch of crops in a bed, you're going to have to have our irrigation. You're going to have to have it watered somehow because they're, you're uh, like in, you know, the example with the lettuce and the green onions, like that's a lot of water they're going to take. Uh, so you want to make sure that they can get the amount of water that they need to, to properly hydrate um, and grow and photosynthesize. So the, yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of it is the, the, the airflow. Um, and yeah, and all those other factors, absolutely. Well, and I noticed with your tomatoes, those are pretty heavily pruned, um, at least the yeah. cherries that you showed, but you do that for all of them out in the field too, not just in a tunnel? I don't, I do prune the cucumbers and the tomatoes just in the tunnel. So like this is not super pruned, but I do prune up to about a foot, you know, maybe 14 inches or so, um, just because I don't want a bunch of leaves on the ground, but like, you know, in this case, these are super pruned. Uh, these are, these are super pruned too. Like these are maybe almost a little bit too pruned, but I try and leave about 14 leaves at the top is like my, you know, that's what I tell, uh, my employee just prune to 14 leaves. That's the easiest way to say it. Um, get your suckers and prune to about 14 leaves. And that way you're getting good airflow through there. Um, and you know, 
getting good fruits at and, and, uh, you know, that's that, that, and yeah, the airflow, especially with tomatoes is super important, but in this scenario where you're outside, you're getting a lot more wind. I'm not as concerned. Like I'm not, and it's just, these are going to blight out. There's no, I've, I've grown them in the best soil ever. And by the end of the season, you know, they eventually blight out. It's just because of our region. We're so humid and we're so wet here. Um, that there's just, you know, I could really, really prune them, but I'm always afraid that's a massive waste of time. So I just prune the bottom leaves for that scenario. So there is good flow underneath the strings there. Right. Um, Kai asks, do you grow any fungi? I used to grow shiitakes in the middle of my flower garden under a huge hackberry tree. Some seasons it did well, they were inoculated logs and the soil underneath was great. Do you have any suggestions on growing fungi with other plants? I did, I think I may have talked about it a little bit on Friday. Um, Winecap Stefaria is one. We've also done, okay, so Winecap Stefaria grows in wood chips. And you, if you're using wood chips in your pathways, you can grow Winecap Stefaria or King Stefaria um, in your pathways, which is great. Like it's functional. <clears throat> I haven't done it to the level that it's actually been profitable. Um I don't, I, it's a really easy spreader. So if you keep feeding those beds and you keep working on it, that I think you could get to the point when you're actually making money on your pathways. Um, I haven't seen that yet. I've tried it for several years and it has not come to fruition, but I'm still playing with it. I, I like having wine caps safaria and I like having that diversity in there. So it doesn't bother me to not make a bunch of money on it, but yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. And then, um, and then we've tried almond agaricus as well. And, uh, that worked okay. They grow well in deep mulches and deep compost because the Garricus family generally grows in compost. So that's like your button mushrooms and stuff. Um, and they grow in compost and we've done that. And uh, they were okay. It wasn't super high yielding, but honestly, I just didn't really like the flavor of the mushroom. My family was just kind of like, oh, this is weird. I don't know what to do with this flavor because it tastes like kind of a sweet almondy mushroom. And I, I, yeah, it was... Um, so you could, and the shot to shiitake mushrooms. Yeah, sure. I mean, if you can find, we used to grow them uh, underneath, uh, yeah, in our fort, like in our unused areas. So that's a good way to like, maybe if you have a shed that's just kind of there and it has some space, um, doesn't necessarily have to be an inner plant. Like it just can use space that you're not necessarily using for something else. Um, or yeah, if, you, if you're watering, like overhead watering some stuff and you notice that a side of your building it's wet. Yeah. We'll throw some shiitake logs there. That's a great way to take advantage of that extra water. Right. Um, Bruce Diaz asked, do you have any experience planting under asparagus? I'm wondering about spring spinach or summer lettuce. Hmm. I would think with asparagus, you may be better off doing something in the fall. I don't have a lot like we've have some asparagus on some farms that we've been on, um, and that we've grown on. And, uh, I haven't done a lot with experimenting with it, but you wouldn't want to compete with it in the spring too much because, you know, you're probably going to have, I don't know. I mean, it'd probably do fine coming through radishes or something. I don't know. It'd be something I'd start small with. Um, I wish I had more experience with that one, but I, I'm planting new crowns on the new property this year. So uh, maybe in a few years, I'll have some better insight on that one. But um, yeah, I think uh, with something like asparagus, <laughs> maybe, um, something like I would think even going more like another perennial, like a tree above it. So you get the asparagus in the spring, then the tree or fruiting bushes or something um, comes after that. And that way you don't have to overly manage that area for annuals. One more in the chat here um, says possibly dumb question, but with living pathways potentially profiting off of pathways, how do you grow things in pathways without stepping on them to the point they are ruined? Yeah. So with the living pathways, we don't get any crops out of them. Um, we, the benefits are the ecology, the, the below ground health of the soil, um, keeping the soil in place and those sorts of things. But if you wanted to use your pathways, um, you know, I've seen where some people will move in their tunnels over the winter, they'll actually get rid of their middle pathway or their middle two pathways, and they'll just plant that to lettuce. And then maybe you have to, you know, kind of, uh, I don't suggest filling it in, but if you, you know, had to work that up because it's going to be compacted. So you have to work it a little bit or maybe put a nice mulch down. Um, and then you, you know, you harvest that as you go and then that pathway can be reestablished or whatever. Um, and that's the thing where like you want something like, you know, the, the mushrooms would be a good way to utilize your pathways for something that could bring you a little bit of extra profit. Um, 
but yeah, generally we don't do a lot of, of cropping out of our pathways. It's just, it's, yeah, it's too complicated and we're stomping the pathways and they're really compacted. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's not something, it wouldn't be a place that I would try and grow too many things. Great. Thank you so much, Jesse. We are going to transition to our next presentation, but Jesse, if you have a minute to hang around, there are a couple more in the chat we didn't get to. And I wanted to read Kai's comment about the asparagus question. Our asparagus would grow like crazy under our persimmon trees. For some reasons, they really liked it. So there's a reinforce that fruit idea. There you go. But okay, um, we're gonna have Jesse stop sharing and Petrus, I believe you want to share directly. So um, you are a co-host, you should be able to do that now. And I'm going to do a brief introduction Production. So this, um, the second section for the vegetable track today is being presented by a Purdue farmer team. Uh, Dr. Peters Langenhoven is a horticulture and hydroponics crops specialist at Purdue in the Department of Horticulture and Landscape Architecture. Nathan Schof is the statewide Purdue Extension Urban Ag Coordinator. Um, together, they will be sharing the results of their research on soil health practices for pepper production. And they are joined by Roger and Mary Winstead, who established Beautiful Edibles in 2015 in Paradise, Indiana. Beautiful Edibles offers an online farm store, multi-season CSA membership, and wholesale bulk and produce delivery services. They grow edible flowers, fungi, and vegetables for the community using sustainable practices. Um, so they are presenting on soil health practices and compost amendments in the context of vegetables. And so uh, can everyone see Petrus's screen? Um, yeah, go, does everything go, look good? Can you hear uh, me? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Good. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Laura. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, great to speak to you today. Yeah, this is uh, always a very interesting topic. And uh, Nathan and I, we, we have uh, some pretty long conversations sometimes in the truck driving uh, to a research plot uh, talking about this. Um, just some interesting uh, uh, facts or a little bit of background. Um, it doesn't seem like the, the COVID-19 pandemic slowed down uh, organic uh, produce uh, or the production thereof in the United States in 2021. We've seen a, a, an increase of about 5.5% uh, in 2021. Um, that is great. I mean, the industry is now standing around um, 92 uh, billion dollars and Indiana is not <clears throat> unfamiliar to organic uh, farming at all. Um, if you look at uh, some research that was done um, a while ago, about 86% of our farms here in Indiana is actually uh, classified according to the USDA as uh, small and medium uh, farms. And most of those farms actually use uh, organic methods to produce their uh, vegetables. So the challenge usually with uh, uh, organic uh, production systems um, is uh, a lack of nutrients at critical times uh, in your uh, production cycle. So optimizing um, the nutrient availability uh, together with soil health uh, could be challenging uh, at times, especially due to the slow release nature of some of the um, amendments, soil amendments that we um, we had. So, you know, some of the best management practices to improve soil health and nutrient management um, includes cover cropping or adding compost or rotating crops or, you know, including uh, pathogen management. And uh, these are all very tricky and uh, not a lot of research has been uh, done on that. Um, we specifically then uh, thought of starting a project uh, where we wanted to uh, look at this. So we always keep in mind that uh, farms have to be profitable, so productive and profitable. So uh, not always do all the, these things go together and it's, it's very important to look at the underlying factors um, that can help you to propel your farm uh, to the next level. So in this context, we uh, applied for a grant to uh, be able to, to do uh, research 
um, that we call as well to market decision making uh, uh, extension program. So we wanted to look at uh, different things that will affect the farm in propelling them to be more productive and more profitable. And that's where we came with this um, uh, project, taking the next step as a small and medium sized farm and understanding the integration of production, food safety and uh, profitability. So basically we have three pillars in our uh, project, uh, economics, where a lot of uh, decision making is happening on the farm and how that can influence uh, things at the end of the day. Uh, food safety, uh, looking at consumer expectations um, and uh, how growers uh, would adopt these uh, consumer um, expectations. The, the portion that we would like to talk to you about today is the, the production segment that Nathan and I are uh, working on. So we're trying to assess uh, some soil health variables, um, looking at best management practices there in the vegetable production system um, and how some of these uh, uh, best features of organic and conventional uh, systems could be utilized individually or collaboratively to uh, make a specific uh, situation work. Um, we'd like to look at the effect of compost on uh, soil health and uh, <clears throat> develop some nutrient management uh, strategies uh, together with that. And the crop of choice in this study is um, peppers. So we are doing this work at three different places in Indiana, in Valparaiso, uh, in Lafayette and Vincennes. We really wanted to capture the uh, the, the length of the state, um, since uh, climate-wise it differs quite a bit, but soil-wise these three locations are also uh, very different. Some of the treatments that we looked at, and of course we cannot really put everything um, into one study, and there should be a lot more work done um, after the study is completed. Um, but we wanted to look at uh, scenarios where we only use organic nutrients or conventional nutrients or if we add compost we will use plant-based or use uh, manure-based composts um, but no cover cropping is planted um, in the uh, in the fall um, they also don't uh, get cover cropping in the summer and obviously every summer um, there will be peppers in the ground so the next set um, that we look at um, is a summer cover crop uh, a scenario where we have uh, mustard. Now, for those of you that know mustard, you know, there are some uh, biofumigation properties to, to this crop. So we wanted to put that to the test too. So we um, uh, applied a anaerobic soil disinfestation treatment. And basically, um, you cut the mustard down uh, very finely with a flail mower. You till it into the ground. Um, you soak the ground with water and then you cover it with the top uh, for four weeks during the, the hottest time of summer. And that will give you um, the benefit of um, anaerobic soil disinfestation where um, bad pathogens um, are being uh, taken care of and to some extent weed seeds and so on. We had another treatment where um, we just told the mustard in and didn't do any <clears throat> ASD treatment on it. Sunimp. Uh, a leguminous crop, so we wanted to see um, biomass production and uh, nitrogen uh, fixing there. Uh, look into that and then sorghum, obviously a very vigorous uh, crop. Uh, you can cut that multiple times during the summer and um, yeah, the crop produces a tremendous amount of uh, uh, biomass. Um, then this treat, uh, these four treatments would not have received the cover crop the first fall uh, and the consecutive years they would actually receive cereal rye and hairy veg and uh, as of this year we will be planting peppers um, during the summer time. Um, looking at the last five uh, treatments, um, now we actually include together with the summer cover we include a fall cover crop, which is the cereal rye and hairy veg, and that will continue throughout the, the lifespan of the project. Um, peppers will be planted um, as of this year, since the project already started last year. Um, every summer, peppers will be uh, put into ground. 
Um, it's only the last uh, treatment here um, that you can see where uh, we excluded a summer crop, but we had peppers in, um, but the winter cover started from the first year. So <clears throat> these are some combinations that we thought uh, would be very interesting to see um, if you build up the soil immediately with um, biomass and how um, that will deplete over time or if you do not uh, plant any summer cover or any winter cover how the, the, the health condition in the soil and the organic content um, will actually uh, deteriorate um, and it might be different for the different locations we even look at so there's a lot of variability uh, built into the um, experiments. Uh, Nathan? Thanks, Petrus. No, I think you covered that part well. And I think when we were talking about these treatments, we, we discussed in particular, um, what is it that would be practical for farmers? I think we work with a lot of different farmers at different scales and, and with different uh, management strategies. In particular, soil health comes up a lot. And, and, we, and oftentimes, some of the questions I get posed with are, um, what kind of soil tests do we find valuable? Um, a lot of people refer to the soil health test at Cornell is sort of being the benchmark or sort of the Cadillac standard that a lot of folks would, would prefer to use, but considering the quantity of samples that some people may have and when they're looking at, at measuring those parameters maybe multiple times per year to, to try to determine if there are any changes in some of those parameters, it can get really expensive. So what we started to do is we looked at a few different labs, um, spoke with them directly and tried to figure out a really practical, affordable, approachable soil health test. And so we decided to Work with Brookside Labs. We felt like they, they had a modified Saney or Haney soil test. Um, and it again, like these, we see a lot of these different um, kind of reports like this. You'll see different uh, soil health score. What does this mean? You know, and that was what we we're kind of looking at. And even you know, we get some some of these questions from the farmers uh, from the Winsteads later. But what can we really determine from this? And so this is what we're, we don't. You know, of course, we don't know enough yet. This is some of our first data we've gotten back yet. But we're looking at some of these factors of um, water exchangeable or water soluble organic carbon, organic nitrogen. Um, these are unique and different than some of the, the uh, traditional nutrition tests we may look at. So, um, you know, we were looking at some of these soil health test scores and really trying to figure out over time, do we see changes? Do we see some yield changes associated with that too? Are we, are we noticing difference, differences or uh, beneficial changes to soil organic, uh, soil organic matter over time? And again, being in the first year, not, we're not going to notice a lot of changes yet, but we're hoping to, to be able to see whether or not this, these soil health tests are effective because more importantly, we want to be able to report to growers, is this something worth you spending your money on? Is it a practical tool for you to use for your management strategies? And as, as Petros mentioned earlier too, I think this is an important part too. We wanted to really use some different amendments that, should, that a lot of growers are currently using. We, want, we, use, uh, we leaned on Morgan compost for their vegan do and dairy do. And one thing we even noticed in our soil health test too were some of the salt contents we noticed and even the dairy do in particular. Um, for folks who are growing in high tunnels, this could be a really um, advantageous thing to look at and to figure out maybe this may or may not be a good amendment for you to use repeatedly over time. And I think one thing we were noticing too with a lot of growers who were applying compost year after year, um, many of us know a lot of that you see a lot of elevated phosphorus in in these soil samples. So um, what are some other amendments we could look at too, as Petrus mentioned earlier, to some of these other conventional amendments, maybe some other organic options in combination with conventional or with uh, cover crops, so we can maybe um, modify or enhance or build that soil quality to, um, to not have to apply compost here up here, because it can be really expensive for some, some growers and some different farms to be able to do that. Yeah, so in terms of the uh, fertilizer sources that we used, um, we used the uh, Sustain 824 and the 374 for the uh, organic treatments. Uh, the 824 um, obviously was used in situations where we had a high amount of phosphorus already in the ground, so we didn't want to add any of that. Um, it also has a 7.2% of available nitrogen that's released over a 12-week period, and it's basically turkey litter. Uh, where they added some feather meal and, and sulfate of potash. Um, the 374 basically is just uh, turkey litter. Um, and then on the conventional side, we use diammonium phosphate, uh, urea and potash to, um, to manipulate um, the fertility in, in those different uh, treatments. 
Cover crop wise, as I said earlier, we use Caliente 199 um, as the master of choice uh, for our uh, biofumigation treatments, uh, sorghum sedan grass, and that was the si Sweet 6 dry stalk BMR variety. Uh, Sun M, there was no variety disclosed on the, uh, the company's uh, website. Um, but yeah, it, uh, it grew pretty tall. <laughs> The pepper varieties we used were Marcato, uh, Socrates, Miras, those were all bell peppers and uh, on the tapered peppers, common Escamilla and uh, Marcato. And this is basically what our uh, field layout uh, looked, at, uh, uh, um, looked like. Um, so these uh, plots that you see here in the front, these were uh, the cover crops that we uh, basically um, just to make it easy for us, we raked the seeds in. On the right hand side, you can see the, the planted pepper plots and uh, those are actually drip irrigated. Yeah, the peppers uh, close to maturity and a whole bunch of them that we harvested uh, the one time. This is the, the mustard cover crop on the left. On the right, you can see um, we've uh, Cut it down with the flail mower uh, on the BCS, uh, rotor told it uh, with another BCS and uh, we dug a little trench around it. Uh, in this situation we had a lot of rain before we actually did this treatment. Um, so we didn't add any additional water on the side, but um, you would actually soak the, uh, the soil before you uh, put this uh, tarp on. This is uh, the the um, sorghum Sudan grass on the left hand side and on the, on the right behind Nathan you can see the, um, the sun imp. Um, this was a little bit before it actually started uh, flowering. Nathan. Thank you. Yeah, before we add up here, just some lessons learned from 2021. Um, the application of soil fertility amendments and you know, before planting, we, we did some side dressing. We had, you know, anticipating some rain events. Um, we did have some issues with a lot of our, our compost washing off some of the plots, um, cover crop seed dispersing in different plots too. So we're gonna change that for this year um, using some plastic mulching to keep some things in place. Um, and again, looking at weed management, we dealt with a lot. And again, like most, most farmers last year, I feel like this was the topic of conversation. Um, you know, a lot of folks we work with aren't using herbicide. You know, we're trying to deal with that too with hand weeding and mowing. We could not keep up with the weed pressures. Like many of you, we really struggle with that. A lot of photos that we took, I mean, we are in waist deep or higher weeds and some issues. So looking to mitigate that this year. And um, yeah, just some of the challenges with seeding and mowing some of the cover crops, anticipating some of the yield and in particular with sorghum, it's really challenging, but um, it's just amazing amount of biomass that would produce. Well, I guess uh, that's it for now. Um, we'd like to thank the USDA and uh, uh, for funding this program. And uh, if you want to reach out to us, you can scan those uh, QR codes there. Um, it will send you directly to an email link um, that you can contact us. But uh, obviously, we will be here for questions. All right, how are we doing on, on sound? Are we doing all right? Yes. Good. Okay, go ahead, Mary. Hi, we're Mary and Roger Winstead of Beautiful Edibles in Paradise, Indiana, which is right outside Evansville. Um, and Laura gave us an introduction earlier, a little bit more about our farm. Um, we're gonna tell you about, uh, Nathan asked us to share our urban farm experience. Uh, we're located, um, like I said, outside of Evansville, um, our locations challenges here were heavy clay, um, inadequate drainage and um, poor soil quality. Um, the property that we're on had about 60 years as unimproved horse pasture with poor quality amendments and invasive growth. And the once rural land is now surrounded, surrounded by a sprawling suburban area from the Evansville area. Um, we 
We worked on, uh, when we started the farm, pulling together several methods um, with success and failure. And uh, we were farming part-time. Um, we had noticed that we were having more frequent and heavier rainfall events, and that was increasing our field flooding, flooding and our weed growth. Um, we spent a couple of years using silage tarps, aged horse manure, uh, we purchased in compost, and we decided to go with a raised permanent bed to, and some drainage ditches, um, a thick wood chip mulching, and these were all pretty successful. Um, we did still struggle with the weed pressure, um, limited time, limited money to control those. Um, that caused us a lot of pests and disease and um, poor production was our failure at times. Um, we also found that we had poor seed germination in areas where we had um, an overgrowth of black walnuts, um, which we tried to remove most of those over the years with the majority of it coming out in 2020. So um, I think we were on to the next one. I'm hitting it. Brown cover, um, as you see under the tomatoes and here in these couple of pictures, um, solved most of our weed pressure. Um, I will say that it added in other problems. Uh, we do struggle with slugs um, during the wet, cool seasons of the spring and the fall. Uh, we've battled um, several vole families that have decided to move in under our ground cover. And um, we do see some fungal uh, mold diseases that'll come. Bottom right picture, you see some um, uh, minuet uh, Napa cabbage that the voles just uh, ate off completely out of the holes. Um, so we decided that growing in tunnels versus growing in the open fields uh, was kind of a solution to extend our season and a steady revenue stream. Uh, helped us be able to move off of part-time farming and into full-time farming, and it decreased the effect of the weather events. And then um, we were able to start dialing in uh, production with regular soil tests, uh, working with several agronomists, um, looking at a prescribed organic fertility program, and um, I'll give a shout out to um, Ken Musselman. Uh, Ken Musselman and uh, Agri-energy Agri -energy yeah. resources for helping us with that. They helped us incorporate the compost tea and the mycorrhizal fungi um, to have a more symbolic, symbiotic relationship with the roots of the plants where we were growing. And we've seen great improvement with that on production. Um, we still, like I said, struggle with a lot of pests. Um, it seems like um, being in the suburban area, um, a lot of our neighbors are spraying um, chemicals and we tend to have a lot of like uh, overgrowth of disease and um, insect uh, problems. Uh, integrated pest management is a constant vigil for us and it's a daily task that we just have to be real observant and we're seeing um, beneficials here along with uh, with our pests, pest, <laughs> bad ones. So um, what we determine as a uh, good soil fertility can actually depend on the crops you're producing and needs. And we saw Jesse growing uh, the bio intense. We've been doing that since we started um, with companion planting growing methods, which can mean that over the course of a season, we could have three to eight different crops um, in each bed during the year. Um, even though we're using the ground cover, um, we'll do six inch, six inch hole spacing um, plant radishes, or in this case, you'll see the marigolds down the side with the basil and the tomatoes in the next bed over in that same tunnel. Um, we did see that the tomato fertility formula that we were using to increase the blooms and the fruit did not work well with greens and brassicas where we didn't want any fruiting. Um, we do sell edible flowers. And so when we have the brassicas bolt like this in the spring, we were able to market those as an edible flower crop. So not a total loss, but um, it's kind of irritating at times to have things bolt on us. Uh, we have had some tricky, um, we've had to come up with for um, rotations. Um, we've tried to incorporate um, cover crops in, which is a little bit more difficult to do with the ground cover on the ground. 
Uh, we do do it in areas where we have uh, open fields and we've tried to go back to some more open field areas instead of all ground covered. Um, we use the edible flowers um, in combination to do pollination, help repel pests and um, attract beneficials in. And uh, top right was uh, tomatoes on a trellis with uh, celosia last year and the bumblebees there are in the middle. Uh, we're just all over that all summer long, it was gorgeous. They fly around and pollinate really, really well. Um, that was a bean crop in the bottom right that we uh, intercropped in um, as a succession. One of, the, one of the rotations. One of the rotations that we did. And the bottom picture is just starts that one of the reason we, we do a lot of starts is uh, the walnut problem and getting things to German. Uh, so we don't do a lot of things uh, planted in the field um, unless it's big like a like the beans and the beans did very well, uh, but most everything else we're, we're transplanting. So um, we increased the size of our farm from one small field and two tunnels that we put up in 2017 um, to five um, caterpillar tunnels uh, in 2020, 20, I think we were finished out, 21 I have on here, uh, which made it necessary for us to kind of mechanize things a little bit more than what we had, like netting and floating row cover for the pests and for um, just um, giving us warmth during the uh, cool seasons. Uh, we are able to grow here in Southern Indiana um, all the way through. We have some issues in January, um, but usually most things will come back out of that. And so we overwinter quite a few crops, some floral um, and uh, quite a bit of uh, the greens and brassicas. brassicas. Um, some root crops too sometimes. Uh, and we did, this is something that we'd struggled with for a long time. We did go ahead and set up the uh, irrigation system on the farm and um, of fertigation. 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 Yeah. Um, um, 2020 brought us the fungi expansion. Uh, we had grown and foraged mushrooms for about 15 years or better. Right. Um, this is Roger on the right, getting some chicken in the woods um, in a park nearby. And uh, we had decided that we wanted to provide mushrooms on a large scale to our fall CSA members. We knew it was a good time in the spring and the fall to grow mushrooms. And our experience in fruiting shiitakes on logs uh, in our tunnels helped us design a low-tech mushroom grow. This is a picture of the grow that we presented uh, in a poster at last year's uh, small farm conference. And uh, we did this just in a portion of one of our caterpillar tunnels. It was a great success with our CSA members, a great um, additional revenue flow for us for the season. And um, when winter temps dropped, we partnered with uh, another local farmer, uh, APE Aquapon Aquaponics, Scott Anderson, um, and moved into his uh, urban indoor location and built out a year round mushroom growth facility. So this is letting us have additional revenue stream through the winter. But, um, and should we talk any more about this? You wanna say something about your mushroom growth? Sure, um, growing mushrooms in its own environment, it's kind of like going into, into space. You have to provide everything that uh, the mushrooms are gonna need the right temperatures, the right humidity. So you're, you're, what we had to do was build an environment that uh, was gonna keep those constant temperatures and uh, with the humidistat. And then we uh, put together a ultrasonic unit that would fog. So it keeps between 75 and 95% humidity. We grow uh, lion's mane, we grow oyster mushrooms and, um, some shiitakes with a little bit of uh, trouble with those due to uh, some uh, infestation of, of other things. Uh, they're a little bit harder to grow. And chestnut mushrooms. And then what we're doing with uh, the mushroom blocks is we're taking them back to the farm 
and we are composting those. And so we are turning those into garden soil um, after uh, they decompose and we're gonna be applying those to the garden. Uh, this is um, Mary and one of our helpers uh, putting a, a mulch layer on top of the and uh, they have, they decomposed and done a really good job. And you can see the top right is the garden soil that is being made from that, the nice uh, compost. And uh, uh, it's a lot different than what our soil looked like, which is the bare soil on the left with the, the clay and uh, not a whole lot of organic matter. So. We're hoping that this really helps as we go on into the next few years and uh, provides a lot better for fertility. So we've got time for questions. If anybody has any questions uh, about our operation, we do grow organically um, and all of our amendments that we put on there are organic and the compost teas are, are all organic as well. Thank you so much, Mary and Roger. So we're going to invite Petrus and Nathan back in here. Um, Tamara has one question in here, and I'm, oh, sorry, I moved my microphone up out of my face. <laughs> Hopefully that's better. Okay, um, Tamara has one question here, and then I think I'm supposed to launch a poll. Um, but she asked in that last picture, and sorry that I already pulled it down, was the last photo for mushrooms on the top of logs or boulders? Okay. Um, I can pull well, it back up for a second here. So sure. you what, what we did, um, I took the mushroom blocks that we grow in and they're, they're in a plastic, uh, but it's not on a boulder at all. It, um, it's, a block of mycelium growing on uh, soybean holes, non-GMO soybean holes, and wood chips. And so what I did, I took them in and cut them in half after we're done fruiting them, and I placed them on the ground and covered them with mulch. So um, yeah, go to the side slide before, if you can. <laughs> Maybe I can? This back one. There you go. Oh, so, sorry, delay. There. There you go. So those are uh, what? Fully colonized. Eight, eight pound blocks of uh, fully colonized uh, with mycelium from, which is basically the root of the mushrooms. And so we, we place those on the ground and cover them with wood chips, make sure they get plenty of moisture. Now these are gonna grow mushrooms for the next year probably and help uh, to decompose the, the uh, wood chips and the uh, uh, soybean holes to make a, a, actually a nice compost soil. And we so these actually, oh, sorry, Mary. Yeah, we don't sell those mushrooms. Um, these are just, I mean, this is just a benefit, uh, just a breakdown of the compost. This is what came out of the bags, right? So yeah. initially when you're growing them, they are in those plastic bags. And then that's sort of yeah. what's left and sporulating when you're composting. Right. right. Great, great. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm gonna launch the poll. And Do you all see this? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so these questions are here to help facilitate some conversation, but we also invite you to turn on your cameras, uh, raise your hand so you can unmute or type a question in the chat. So far, one of you have answered the first question. There we go. People are starting to chime in.
I don't know, Nathan or Petrus, if you want to comment on these answers or Roger and Mary, you want to talk about when you do test your soil, how, how does that inform your practices? I don't know. All right. I'll answer. Um, we usually test in the spring and um, we would like to test more frequently. We have ran some plant tissue tests once, but um, that's something that's a little bit diff more difficult for us to get planned in. So um, we are very high in magnesium and calcium. And that was, it was basically off the charts uh, when we first started this. So we were really out of balance and our phosphorus and uh, potassium were in the dirt. I mean, it wasn't in the dirt, but uh, it was really low. Uh, so uh, we had to add a lot of those things uh, like Tennessee brown rock and um, just uh, K-sulfate uh, to get our soil just to the point yeah. where they start to start producing. Yes. Yeah, it's great to see that uh, so many of our audiences um, doing soil testing. I mean, that is really critical for uh, making informed uh, decisions as to um, what your next step will be in managing that uh, soil fertility. Um, and that you don't over apply uh, something that you think uh, is actually very beneficial to your soil. And uh, by adding that, you might just uh, create a, a scenario where it's not uh, good for your crop. So that is great to see. I don't know, Nathan, do you have a comment on the soil test question? Yeah, too, well, no, and even to touch on what Roger, what you just mentioned, just some of those factors being, or those, um, you know, nu nutrients being out of balance too. And I think, I, you know, we were talking earlier about a lot of people who applied compost regularly, there's, you know, an imbalance between or there's a lot of phosphorus and maybe that um, not not enough zinc or, and um, that can certainly be an issue and it can create a lot of a lot of pest issues for people too. So um, it's interesting to hear you guys talk about that too and how that um, I'm, I'm, I know you mentioned you guys you guys mentioned before that you do apply compost, but that I'm curious too what like you you touched upon earlier the agronomists you work with um, what kind of tests are they doing what kind of recommendations have they made that have really you felt like have really helped you guys dial in your, your soil quality? Um, it's a, with Waters Ag, we do a basic four uh, soil test. So it's gonna give a lot of micronutrients, uh, soil pH, buffer pH. Um, and so the recommendations I'm gonna get from that agronomist and not, not to put him down, but he's saying put, you know, two point, eight pounds per what a thousand square feet of nitrogen on there which uh, i'm not going to do that uh but uh then i get the recommendations from ken and he's going to say okay you need so many pounds of boron you're raising uh brassicas and they're going to need that boron and so we've got 50 pound bag of boron that will blast us forever on this uh two acres but uh so those things dialing in those micronutrients, I think is a, is a big deal, especially uh, when we're looking at doing a either cucumber or tomato versus doing uh, lettuce, because we certainly don't wanna bump up uh, the flowering in the lettuce, but we do want a lot of flowering in our tomatoes and cucumbers and things like that. So kind of dialing in what we need to do on each uh, crop. And that gets a little difficult when you're intercropping or trying to do one crop right after another and not soil testing in between. So it gets a little bit tricky uh, trying to really dial in what you want to do for each crop. Are you applying most of your amendments or nutrients um like pre-plant before the season or are you going back through once your beds and crops are established and like adding, I think you did mention fertigation. So putting some of it in there. Right, um, we do 
lot, all the dry amendments before we put uh, a plant in um, in the spring and sometimes uh, in the fall as well mm -hmm. uh, with dry uh, um, amendments. And um, then we do a uh, weekly uh, fertigation with uh, compost tea and uh, whatever it's going to be required to get the uh, K-sulfate in there to produce a, a better crop of tomatoes or whatever it's going to need based on our tissue tests. I don't see another question, so I'm going to jump in and ask again. Do you okay, make do you make your own compost tea or do you purchase that? We we would love to make it, but we failed. Yeah, we, we didn't do a good job of it. We didn't do a good job. And so uh, we do purchase a product through Agri Energy Resources, and that's been just an easy, yeah, easy way to do it. It's a concentrate. So yeah, it's it's really easy to do. And we use one right now called MVP, and it's it's got a lot of uh, good amendments into it, um, a lot of uh, biological agents so right we have one question in here what advice do you have for someone just starting mushroom production start small <laughs> yeah. um and don't worry about things failing uh, just keep trying uh start with a small murphy tent or uh some if you want to try it uh outside you can try it outside uh but it's much better to do it inside as get a couple of bags or order from North Spore. They have uh, different bags that you can order and you can do them on a coffee table or where you want, wherever you want to do it. But uh, I would start with a couple and then look at uh, getting a little bit bigger environment. You're going to have to bump up your, all your humidity and all that in a bigger environment, uh, controlling uh, the input of air that makes sure it's clean because contamination really happens quickly and easy. And if you don't like to clean, don't get into mushrooms because <laughs> you, you got to clean uh, the environment every week uh, or you're going to start getting contamination. In contamination, Roger, you mean like fungi, spe fungal species that you don't want in there right. that'll start Correct. to take over? Yeah. Which, what species would you recommend starting with? Is there one that's easier to grow than the than another? Oysters. Well, oysters. They're yeah. oysters. Down. They grow in the trees around here, so yeah. um, it's it's really easy. They pop up in the spring and the fall um, in the Midwest. Uh, Lion's mane would probably be the second one. Yeah, lion's mane is not not too hard either. Um, and uh, so I think our we do different species of uh, different uh, not species varieties. Different varieties, different strains of oysters based on the time of year, uh, like pinks and golds and things like that are good hot weather mushrooms and then some of the blues and uh we've got one called king blue that just uh is a really really good producer year round um and so we don't and blacks will only grow when it's a uh, cooler weather uh and we're growing in a place that's not totally temperature controlled uh it's a uh, large masonry building that uh it keeps pretty good temperature, but uh, not it's not totally temperature controlled. So we're we're going up and down in the seasons. Now we're building a new facility uh, that's going to be totally temperature controlled. So hopefully we'll be able to do different uh, mushrooms year round uh, instead of just seasonally.
sorry. We have a couple more minutes. Um, we can ask a couple questions, but I did want to put up on your screen here. We ask that you please um, fill out this survey and let us know what you thought of the content and today's presentations. So you can hold up your smartphone and scan that QR code, or you should see a link to it placed in the chat as well. I'm going to do a, a shout out for some, if anybody wants to do some research on uh, oyster mushrooms, being able to remove uh, walnut toxicity from the ground, I've got a great place to try your test study. <laughs> I love that. Okay, um, I'm also, I'm going to advance this slide. There's a couple more things. Um, we want to share this that Purdue is an institution is an equal opportunity provider. And lastly, save the date for 2023. We really hope that we're back in person um, in Hendricks County, March 3rd through the 5th. Um, but with that, I really want to say thank you so much for everyone who attended our vegetable session today. Uh, the Small Farm Conference webinar series will be back tomorrow from 12 to 1.30, same time, uh, talking about pollination, pollination on your farm. So join us again then. Thank you so much to all of our presenters today, Roger and Mary and Petrus and Nathan. Jesse, if you're still here, we really learned a lot. And stay tuned in April, you will receive information as to how to access the recorded presentations from this series. So thank you so much, everyone.